Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Television Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Aaron, and how's everybody doing out there in the broadcast world? I'm doing great today, and you know, oftentimes I find myself working on things creatively and working on projects, and the world shuts me down. Like, I'll do something creative and fun, and I'll put all my energy into this project, but there's so much going on right now that you can't help but feel overwhelmed. By everything. So, today's recommended viewing experience is inside a pillow fort, or a blanket fort. Because it's something fun, it's creative, you can do it with whatever you have laying around the house, and it's easy to take down. Because once it's done, you just put it away. And if things don't go your way creatively, it's a blanket or a pillow fort. You can walk away and start again. These days, when I work on something creatively, I can't just walk away because this is the only thing I have to focus on. But if you want to make a pillow or a blanket for it, just make it. Have fun with it, sit in it, listen to this wonderful podcast, and enjoy yourself. All right? I hope you guys have someone close that you can listen to with this. But we're going to talk about what we have for us today. Segment one, we're going to be doing our streaming breakdown, where each week we pick a different streaming service and break it down to make it easier for general viewing, because a lot of times these days everything is so muddled and there's so much new content that I feel lost when I look at streaming services. So we're going to look at that to make it easier for you. Today's topic is Netflix, and then around the end of the show we're going to be talking about two relatively new TV shows that I am obsessed and in love with, and I think everybody should check them out, so... All right, let's get into our streaming breakdown. So each week we pick a streaming service and we're going to break it down for what it is and to make it easier for simple viewing. This week we're talking about Netflix. And so as we go into Netflix, I want to specify that Netflix is a mixed bag. And I don't mean like every time you go to the website or you go to the app that you're going to get something random and new and you're going to see something that's very extraordinary. No, what I mean is that Netflix has a lot of content. And by that I mean they have contents about baking, they have shows about cakes, they have shows about monsters, they have shows about monsters being made from cakes. There's just so much on the platform that whenever I log in these days I'm overwhelmed with all the new content. Because it seems like they used to kind of tailor things to you based on what you liked to watch. And I know that they did that because they used to tell you they were like... Here's relative shows, here's things that you like, that you might like, based on your viewing. But nowadays, it really feels like they're just pushing a lot of their own new content, which is fine. I'm not mad about them pushing their own new content. Some of their content is amazing. I'm just, I get overwhelmed with everything that's going on these days. And I feel like, especially when I go to a streaming service, I go there to relax I go for entertainment. I don't go to be thrown 30 new shows or movies and have no idea what to watch. I don't want to be lost when I go there looking for comfort. I was talking the other day about Netflix should put in a new tab or like a new area where all of their new content, their new movies on the platform, the new TV shows that they're introducing or new things they've got the rights to should all be in one tab. And when you go to click on that tab, it's all organized and nice and neat so you can see everything you want. But then your main page, excuse me, your main page remains as it is. You know what I mean? 
Like, your main page will continue to be the shows you like. It'll be shows similar to what you like. It'll show you movies similar to the genres you like. This way, you can keep things contained, and you can still see things relative to you, but then you can go check out the new things. You can go access some of that new content. And I think that's something that they should look into doing, because that sounds like it would make a lot more sense than just throwing everything at you like they're doing these days. It's just a lot. It's it's a lot from Netflix. It's a lot from every streaming service, which is why we're going to break it down today. So, you're sitting there, you're watching Netflix, there's so much new stuff, they have new releases, they have new things being added to the site. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. But let's break down some of the movies on there right now. I know this is the television podcast, but... There's a lot of good movies on Netflix, and Netflix is a streaming site for everything. So if you're feeling in the bit of a uh, Spielberg mood, Steven Spielberg, there's a lot of his movies on there. And specifically, there's six amazing movies that everybody should watch if you haven't already. And they're comfy movies. They're movies to watch to make you feel good about some old times. So when I'm going to say that, let's talk about them. All three of the original Jurassic Park movies are on Netflix. All three of the first ones. So you have original Jurassic Park, which is a masterpiece with that amazing animatronic dinosaur. Then you have the Lost World Jurassic Park, and then you have three. And all of those are on Netflix. So you could go and spend the next full day almost just watching Jurassic Park on Netflix. And I think that's amazing. It's something you can go do to relax. You can chill out. I had no idea they were on there. And I am now planning a day where I can just go and relax and watch all three of those movies. But my day also involves three other Spielberg movies. You see, because when Spielberg worked on Jurassic Park, he also worked with a special effects company owned and ran by George Lucas. And they worked together on other movies, those being the Indiana Jones movies. All three Indiana Jones movies, or at least the first three, <clears throat> are also on Netflix. All three of them are there. So you've got Raiders of the Lost Ark, you've got Temple of Doom, and you've got that other one that I can't remember right now. I think it's The Last Crusade. All three of them are on there, as well as the Jurassic Park movies. So you could go and spend a full day just watching Spielberg movies. And all three of them are so good, they're fun, they're entertaining. They're exactly what you want when you go on Netflix, in my opinion. There's something to relax, chill out to, and you can really just watch them and have fun. And I, in, in today today's culture right now, we just need to have fun more. So I think kicking back and watching Jurassic Park and Indiana Jones... Two of the most recognizable, like, opening sounds ever. You got dun 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 dun, dun. That's Indiana Jones, right? Everybody has that. It's amazing. And then you've got Jurassic Park. you got the dun 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 I'm not the best, but you get what I'm saying. And everybody loves those. The moment you hear those opening theme songs, everybody calms down. Everybody laughs. They have fun. They've been turned into jokes throughout the years, but people... Still love them. We keep coming back to them. And I think people should just go watch them. You should just go enjoy yourselves. And the movies themselves are amazing. Because Jurassic Park, the first one, oh my god. When that came out, it was a cultural phenomenon that took the world by storm. Because you got to remember, back then, nothing like that had ever come out before. So the idea of seeing a massive dinosaur up on the big screen with real people at a park that looks like a real theme park blew people away. It was like if you watched ninjas take over Disney World. That's the kind of entertainment or value they had that first time they watched it. Nowadays, of course, we have multiple, multiple new remakes of it. And those are fun and they're okay, but they will never hold up to the original. And it's great. It's amazing. And because it's on there, along with its two sequels, I absolutely think people should go watch it. And just go have fun with it. Spend a day doing that for yourselves. Take the time with your family. Maybe sit in a blanket fort. Maybe sit in a pillow fort. And while you watch those movies, 
remember that there is a good joke in there where a velociraptor on a plane sits up and goes, Alan. <laughs> That's it. That's the bit. That was the joke. And then Alan wakes up from a nightmare because he was dreaming about this Velociraptor on a plane. That's that's all I'm going to say about this. Okay? So go watch... Go watch Indiana Jones. Go watch the Jurassic Park movies. They're all on Netflix. They're amazing. And I think everybody should just watch them if you haven't. Alright. So now we're going to talk about some of that new content coming out of Netflix. Because I mentioned old content and I mentioned new content. For me, the old content... Is Jurassic Park and Indiana Jones. But there are two new shows coming up from Netflix right now that are pretty fun to talk about. And the first one is <clears throat> a second season of a show was just released called Umbrella Academy. And what that is, is it's a new, like, gritty superhero show written by Gerard Way, who is the previous lead singer of a band called My Chemical Romance. And when he was done with that, or while he was still in that band, he was writing, and he liked to write, and so he created these comic books. So he created The Umbrella Academy, which is a new comic book series through, I believe, Marvel. And then he also created a side character for Spider-Man called Penny Parker, who is a different alternate reality Spider-Woman. And she's this little girl with, like, this giant robot, and she's in a movie called Into the Spider-Verse, which is also on Netflix, which is... A topic for a different episode entirely, but that movie is amazing, so everybody needs to go watch it. It's on Netflix now, but we're going to focus on Umbrella Academy for right now. Basically, what it is, is it's this group of kids that are all adopted by one billionaire. He's this weird eccentric guy, and they were all born on the same weird day for no reason, and none of their mothers showed any signs of labor, and it's very, these mysterious forces. So the, the strange billionaire adopts them, raises them, and then we hard cut to the future, and that's where the show takes place. And in the future, every, things have changed, of course. They all have their own jobs. They're all living their own lives. Some of them have superpowers, but they all get brought back together to try to figure out what happened to their father. Because their, mafa- their father mysteriously disappears. And that's what they all come back to do, to focus on. And it looks interesting. It looks amazing. The second season has just come out. Critics love this show. And I don't usually take what critics say in hand. But for this, I wanted to go see what they were talking about it. And they like it. It's fun. It's a new superhero TV show that really lowers the stakes. Because after Endgame, the universe exploding and half of life all being wiped out, those are big events. Those are huge events. And sometimes you just want smaller superheroes. Like Spider-Man, you want smaller conflicts that mean more to the characters. And these characters going out of their way to try to save their dad and to try to find him, I think that's amazing. And that sounds like a nice, fun storyline. I do also have to say, they do have to try to stop the world from ending, but, but, but it's mainly about their dad, okay? That's the main focus of the story. Not the world-ending events, but their dad. Focus on the small story. And you'll be happy. Another show coming out of Netflix right now that has particularly piqued my interest is something known as Down to Earth with Zac Efron. Let that sink in. Down to Earth with Zac Efron. I'm not just stating that he's in the show. That's the full title is Down to Earth with Zac Efron. Now, this isn't like some science or animal planet show. No, this is a show, I believe, released by Netflix. It's just Zac Efron traveling around the world, eating amazing food for free from different locations. That's the dream job, isn't it? To be rich enough to just travel around the world and just eat foods for free on a television show and you're Zac Efron? I think the dream is to be Zac Efron is what I'm getting at here. He's living his best life right now with that show because basically what that is, is it's him getting to relax and calm down. Because we've watched him in High School Musical, we watched him in Baywatch, and if you remember in Baywatch, he is built. He is fit, and he has to be for that movie. 
But with Down to Earth, since he's just traveling and eating exotic foods, he's eating every day for the show, he's enjoying things, he's living life, he doesn't really have time for exercise, he's not as, like, bodybuilder fit. And he loves it. He talked about in an interview recently how this show really changed his perception on acting. Because he's not really acting in this one. He's just enjoying food, and he's just having a great time, and people seem to be liking it. Critics hate this show, so a good counterpoint from Umbrella Academy. The critics say it's simple, say it's stupid, that it has no place in today's society. But kind of the message of today's show is things are rough, and we want to be happy. So if you want to be happy, and you want to watch Zac Efron, an actor you possibly enjoy, just have fun relax and eat this amazing food from around the world, go ahead and give it a look. I know the word on the street from the people is that this show is amazing. Almost every person I've talked to about this show so far has given it a perfect rating. They love it, and they would love nothing more than to keep watching it. And you know what? Just a show involving a famous person going around eating for free sounds horrible. It sounds like a rough idea. It sounds like a rough show. If, if, it was anyone other than Zac Efron. Because I know for a fact that he is tired of doing all that hard exercise and doing those movies where he has to look like a Greek god. And every character in those movies do. And he just wants to relax and eat food. And I get that these days, especially being stuck at home. I'm going to list off some of the different places he goes to, just so you guys can get kind of an idea and feel as to where he goes. So the first episode is Iceland. He goes there, he gets to meet some some reindeer, and then he gets to try some reindeer meat and try some of the natural wonders. He goes to France, he goes to Costa Rica, he goes to Puerto Rico, he goes to London. Just a bunch of different places to go and try their amazing, unique cuisine. And I think that's fun. It's just something nice and relaxing to enjoy with your family. Because while critics might call it simple, sometimes you just want to watch somebody have fun because you're not able to. You want to live your life and project through them. And I wish I was rich enough to travel around the world and eat amazing foods for free. I guess riches doesn't count into it if it's for free, but still, you get what I'm saying. Sometimes it's nice to just enjoy And that's kind of the idea of this first segment, is to just relax and enjoy Netflix. Because there's a lot on there, and it may be overwhelming, but if you check out some of these new movies and shows that I've recommended, then hopefully it'll make it a little bit easier for you. Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. Keith keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip hop, and the top 40. And we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further because this is the gold standard in music podcast. Alright, hello everybody, welcome back from that break. Welcome back for segment two. Today we're going to be talking about animated shows to binge while stuck at home. Because while a lot of people are spending their lives at home, they're looking for new things to really just sit down, put on in the background, and forget about. And for me, I have a couple of like animated adult shows that I love to just throw on in the background while I do anything else. Just for, for noise and for comedy occasionally if I pay attention to it. So we're going to be talking about two of those shows today, and both of them have a bit of a similar theme, because in the first one we talked about Spielberg having six movies on Netflix, Well, now we're going to talk about a man having two TV shows on two different streaming platforms. So this is some variety for you, for those of you out there that might not have had Netflix before, but this way you can at least try to watch one of these shows, because I'm assuming most people these days do have Hulu or Netflix in one aspect or the other, or at least Disney+. Plus which is amazing. So we're going to be talking about a man called Matt Gronich, who is the creator of multiple different shows. The big one you probably know about is The Simpsons. 
and he made that one, and that show is still going on, and that's 31 seasons long. I'm just going to briefly say that The Simpsons is on Disney+, Plus and on Hulu, and on YouTube, and Sling TV. So if you wanted, you could go watch The Simpsons right now. Watch all 31 seasons. And if it's about 24 minutes an episode, and that's 684 episodes, that is 16,000 minutes. You were watching for 274 hours of watch time. That is an amazing amount of content. But that's not actually the show or one of the shows that I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to let you know that if you do have Disney+, Plus, The Simpsons is there. Very long-running show, very funny show. But we're going to talk about two of his lesser-known shows today. The first one being called Futurama, which is this high sci-fi futuristic TV show that follows the character by the name of Philip J. Fry, who is a delivery boy in the 1990s, who accidentally freezes himself for a thousand years and wakes up in the year 3000. And the show is just funny. It's just creative and interesting, and I genuinely enjoy watching it. I don't say that as a joke. I mean, every time I put on this show, I'm having fun. This is the one that I use in the background for my watch preference. I have it going if I'm writing, if I'm working, if I'm doing anything that I don't have to put 100% attention into. Futurama is where I put my things. Because it's, it's a show that is a perfect example of having an educated writing team. And I don't mean that like most of the writers on TV shows these days have degrees in writing or in comedy or in screenplay. I mean the folks who wrote this show almost every single one of them have doctorates in a high field of science like astrophysics or rocket engineering. The people that wrote this show along with Matt Gronage are extremely smart and educated and it shows in the writing. Because while well, Futurama is, of course, it's an adult animated show, it's a cartoon, okay? It has cartoonish aspects, and it's it's funny to laugh at and to see all the different ridiculous things they do, and it's it's just funny. I, I recommend to young adults or to adults out there listening to just sit down and put it on, because I love it, and I'm 20 years old, and I watch it every day, and my great-great-uncle who is about 86, he watches it every day. And he loves Futurama. And there's a character from that show called Bender, who is this robot. And my great-great-uncle loves him. And he watches him every single day. And so this show, it, it closes age gaps. It's funny. It's clever. And I think people should really give it a chance to just go out there and watch it. When it first came out, okay, it originally came out in... I believe it was 2003 was its original broadcast date. Uh, no, it originally aired in 1999, so the same year it came out. Um, or the original like place, the original setting takes place. So it came out in 1999. It was canceled a couple different times because during its running, there were mess-ups with its show running when it would come out, and so the views for the show started dying down. This was mostly in part to its parent company, Fox, who owned it during that time because Fox started changing and getting multiple different shows. And in 2003, when it was originally canceled, they started having all these different broadcasts come out and they changed when shows would be airing. So people would go to different shows thinking that was the new time for Futurama and losing it inside of that and not being able to keep up with the new episodes. So people thought the show was declining. When in fact the show was growing an audience. Over those couple years that it was over, it was demanded back by audience, by popular demand. Because it became a cult following. People loved watching this show. People of all ages had fun with it. It was supposed to be the new family guy. It never did become that, of course. But it was still interesting and fun. I remember... When I was a kid walking around the neighborhood, almost every neighborhood in the house, or almost every house in the neighborhood, had this show playing, if it was on. Because it's funny, it's smart, it teaches you things about life, it actually has life lessons throughout the episodes, and you don't always find that with animated shows. And so, with Futurama especially, 
I think because it's so smart and because the writing team behind it is educated, you have these moments that are just genuinely beautiful in the show. Because while it is funny and it's a throwaway show and it's kind of like it has dumb humor and sometimes it uses like potty humor, other parts it gets you emotionally because there's entire episodes or arcs that take place around our main characters and when it does that it creates this sense of like draw where you are drawn into those characters and into those people and you feel emotionally connected with them during these moments especially when things either go bad or some of those more 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 emotional moments when fry our main character doesn't really cope with the fact that he left behind his friends and family and throughout the show, all of the seasons, we see that he ends up he ends up doing that. He ends up coping with it. Sometimes not healthily. Other times, it's about a really sad dog. And it's beautiful. And it makes you cry. It really does. Now we're going to move on to our second show, which is another Matt Gronit show. But this one takes place entirely on Netflix. Our no segment one talked a lot about Netflix, but this is an animated show on there right now that I recommend for people. This show is called Disenchantment. Now, Disenchantment is another show by, by Matt Gronich. I don't believe it has the same writing team, so it's not as educated. But instead of taking place in high fantasy, or I'm sorry, in high future, this one does take place in high fantasy. So it's like a D&D meets uh, Game of Thrones meets comedy, basically. And so it's an animated adult show with dark humor, that just takes place in the medieval times. We follow a a princess by the name of Tia Beanie, but she goes by the nickname of Bean. And she just goes around wrecking things up because she doesn't want to be a princess during this time. She hates it. She hates her father, who's the king. And so she's just going around trying to live her life, have fun adventures with her pals. She has a little elf companion named Elfo. Yeah, remember when I said that the writing team wasn't as smart? They named the elf Elfo, so... Yeah, maybe not as... Maybe not as good. But still, it's still funny. Uh, I genuinely enjoy the show because, while it does take place in medieval culture, it has a lot of modern-day jokes and references, and they talk about things that are modern-day problems. And it's funny, and they bring in situations that I never thought possible... And there's an actual, like, an underlying plot to this show, which doesn't actually happen often in animated shows. You know, most, most times they are kind of everything's cut and dry and fixed by the end of that 30-minute episode. But Matt Grunich has a, has a bit of a, a thing where he doesn't really like that. He does it in The Simpsons, but for Futurama and Disenchantment especially, they have through lines. Because Futurama had a planned plot and storyline, and when it got cancelled and came back, they started spewing out episodes in, like, parts. So, one season is only three episodes told in five parts each episode, or I think it's maybe four parts each episode. But they're long, and it's, it's, a, it's an actual story, and every single part plays into the other parts and other episodes. And so I thought that was amazing. And occasionally they'll they'll introduce characters and back away and be like, they're there, that's it. But Disenchantment is different. Disenchantment has a dedicated through line where almost every episode interacts with the plot in the different things that are happening. We actually get to see change within the show, which doesn't happen much with animated shows. And what I mean by that is... The first 10 episodes were released August 17th of 2018 on Netflix, and they were immediately uh, taken up in good favor, and people loved watching them and loved being a part of that show, mainly because you got to watch things change. And I'm, I don't think I'm doing a great job of explaining that. Let me go into that a little bit more. In the show, characters' choices and their decisions impact other episodes. So what Bean, the princess, does in episode one, or maybe episode three, affects things that occur in season two, episode four. That's how far off some of these choices get. And 
with most animated shows, you don't get that. You lose that sense of story for just a wacky, wild adventure. And while Disenchantment definitely, and I do mean definitely, hits the wacky, crazy adventure mark, it also has a through line. It also has some of the funniest dialogue I've ever heard in my life. This show has puns, it has jokes, it has clever writing. Maybe not as clever as Futurama, but it's still there. And it's it's just poking fun at a lot of modern-day problems and ideals. And the se- second season brings in an entire aspect of high fantasy that most people entirely forget about. And that aspect that comes into play in the second part is this thing called steampunk. If you don't know what steampunk is... It's basically like if high fantasy met automatons. So think Henry Ford, 1920s, but everything is futuristic. But we stayed in that time period. So you have like jetpacks and things like that, but they're all made of gears and like golden trinkets and things like that. So basically if Leonardo Di- or Leonardo da Vinci created a jetpack, he'd use golden gears and things of that nature. Think same way. And so they introduce amazing steampunk things in this entire other kind of like continent that changes how the entire show is done and shaped and the fact that they do that and it continues to be that way throughout the rest of the show and i'm assuming it will impact season three which should be coming out soon that that's interesting to think about because not a lot of animated shows do that and i really praise this show for going at it so it's called disenchantment it's on Netflix, and then the other one is called Futurama, that's on Hulu, that's on actually in a lot of different places, let me make sure I tell you the right ones, but it, it's on quite a few, it's on Hulu with a subscription, it's on YouTube TV with a subscription, and if you have Sling TV with a premium subscription, you can watch it there. I recommend Basic Hulu, Basic Hulu has it, and it's, it's amazing, it's fun, it's just a really good show, and Futurama is funny, it's smart, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. And I think the same thing about Disenchantment, because Disenchantment, while it's a different genre, it has a through line, it has a story. And if you want to learn to care a little bit more about the actions and choices in a show that's animated, watch Disenchantment, because you will become attached to these characters, and things will happen to them that you need to be prepared for, because the show has consequences. I I think that's a great way to summarize that. Disenchantment is an animated show with consequences. And you need to be aware of that going in. Because the things that Bean might do, or there's another side character whose name is Lucy, who is this tiny little demon cat, the choices they make will have consequences. And then in Futurama, the choices they make, not so much. It's just, it's fun, it's crazy, it's wacky. So if you want something with more grounding in reality, like things will happen and story progress, go watch Disenchantment over on Netflix. If you want something that's just a fun background show that's whimsical and interesting and funny, go watch Futurama. Those are the two shows that I want to talk about today on Animation Breakdown, and I'm so happy that everybody could come and enjoy those. If you give them a look, let me know please, because I do love those shows, and genuinely, they are some of my favorite things out there right now. And so, yeah, if you, if you get a chance to, just let me know. Let me know what you think. Tell me if you've already watched them, if you like Disenchantment, are you ready for season three? I'm going to get everybody ready for the break, and stay tuned for segment three, where we're going to do flops or bops. We talk about TV shows that used to be bops that ended up flopping, okay? So I hope everybody's ready for that, and I'll see you after the break. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. 
whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed that break. Now let's get into segment three. We're going to talk about bops to flops. Now, what does that mean? What what exactly does that mean? Basically, I'm going to talk about a show that I think was really, really good all the way up until the point where it wasn't. That sounds stupid, but I promise you it's going to be great. So, for example... A show that was really good until its near final season or its couple final seasons. Let's use a popular one that was referenced recently, Game of Thrones. A lot of people were not ups- were not happy with that final season. I believe it was season 8. And a lot of people were demanding a new season. They thought the writing was poor. And a lot of things, they felt things went downhill. We're not going to talk about Game of Thrones. We're going to talk about a different show. That was just my example. The show I want to talk about today is a show called... Scrubs. I don't know if you're familiar with Scrubs, but Scrubs is a fun doctor show about two interns that come into this this medical school, this hospital, and they arrive and they're doing their best to kind of rise through the ranks of doctors here and become a part of this medical school in this hospital. So they come in as medical students, and they learn the robes, they're interns, they're trying to figure out how things go. Then they become real doctors throughout the show. Uh, The two main characters are JD, which is John Dorian, and then Dr. Turk, who is this surgeon. He's a young surgeon that comes in, and he eventually becomes a full-time surgeon, one of the best in the operating room. And JD becomes this amazing doctor, and things get great. And the show's really fun, and it went on for nine seasons. It originally aired in 2001, and the final episode aired in 2010. So, a nine-year long-running show with nine seasons. And the tenth season was canceled, and the show was put to an end. But that's not where the show flops. No. I've watched this show multiple times. I love this show. It's funny. Sometimes it's clever. Sometimes it's too far. And they have jokes that are insensitive and bad. But it's it's still fun, and it's enjoyable, and I like watching the show. Now, the show set itself up as an original network show with NBC from seasons 1 to 7. And then, I believe there was an additional season with ABC, and that's where the next two seasons came from. Well, the original show ended beautifully with this amazing moment where one of our main characters there's there's about five main characters okay there's a couple different doctors we meet there's the head of the hospital there's the head doctor there's this nurse and then there's another uh doctor who's training with them and she is there and she goes back and forth with them and that's elliot she's an amazing doctor as well and so we, we, we spend all this time with this wonderful cast. It's so funny. They have this on-screen charisma and everybody. You can just tell that they love what they're doing. And the show has moments similar to Disenchantment where it really just kind of lets you have it emotionally. It hurts to watch the show because sometimes it's so beautiful and pretty And this show, especially Scrubs, talks about the meaning of life oftentimes because they work in a hospital surrounded by death. And it's just amazing to see a show tackle those concepts from a comedic standpoint. Because those moments when they really do let go of the comedy and let you feel that pain, it's genuine. And it is emotional and amazing. But the original show had... This beautiful, beautiful ending where one of the main characters leaves the hospital after 
years of working there with everyone and they go on because they're trying to to start a new life for themselves and start their future and it's this beautiful emotional moment and everybody's saying goodbye and every single character gets that final moment as if to not only say goodbye to that character but also to the audience because that was supposed to be the end of the show and then that main character leaves and it was it was it that was the end of it that was supposed to be the final episode and then it got brought back for additional season they decided you know what we're gonna make it worse and the original writers for seasons one through seven did not they did not want it to continue they said it was over they said that their final story arc was finished. They told the story they wanted to. And then the show came back by popular demand because ABC wanted to make more shows and the audience, the people that were watching it, wanted more content. And it just, it hurt. Because the main creator of the show said he was he wanted it to be done, it was over, the story was told. And the main actor of the main character in the show was like, I'm done, I'm tired as well. His name is Zach Braff. Zach Braff said that the show was supposed to be over because everybody's storylines had come to an end. And then ABC announced that there'd be another season. And everybody kind of went into panic mode where they were like, what happens... Now, do we keep telling the same story? One of our main characters is gone completely. How do we help that? Out? How do we how do we do this? And they do their best to really keep up with it, but the original writer's gone. He takes off for that ninth season and he he comes back and he tells everybody that he does not want to work on Scrubs anymore. He says that he doesn't want to get a part of it. He doesn't want to help with the writing anymore. And they go, okay, that's fine. We're taking over. And ABC brings in a new writing department. They bring in new producers. And they revamp the show for that final and ninth season. And everything they set up, every character arc, every motivation, that final one of those main characters moving away and no longer being a part of that main cast, it's all just kind of retconned. And if you don't know what that means, is it means everything that happened meant nothing because of the new events that we learn. And they basically, they bring everybody back. They change the, the, the set and the location entirely. And they change the plot. And it's, it's no longer about the main characters that we've fallen in love with and that we've gotten used to. They introduce an entire new set of characters. There's almost up to nine new characters that are all supposed to be main characters that they introduce. And then three of the old characters are there, but they're not participating, really. They're a part of the show, but it's, it's mainly about these new characters, which... I guess if they were attempting to take the show in a new way and they wanted to revamp like they did, then that's kind of the move you make. But you can't just make that enormous jump with no warning, especially if you are an, your audience of this show loves its style, loves its comedy, loves the writing, loves everything about the characters, and then one season... You have everything that you've built and created just tossed out the window like it was nothing. And that's essentially what happened with the show. Because they worked so hard on it. They did all these things to create just this sense of of great, of ending. And then just tossed it out. And I, I genuinely don't think that people understand when they make those decisions, what they're doing. Because as a studio executive, you're sitting in an office. You're looking at numbers. You see ratings. You see what people like, what they don't like, or at least you think you do. And 
the the people that are making these choices, they see ratings, they see demands for more, and they think, I don't care about this writer who's telling me how to broadcast my network's show. I care about getting the people what I think they want. And so that's exactly what happened. They created season eight and season nine. Season eight was was supposed to be the brought back season where they fixed everything and they were like hey this is we're gonna do our best to resolve any open conflicts and then season nine was just bad that's the jump they made where they changed everything they bring in like i said a bunch of new characters they do new storylines they change the setting of the entire place because one of the main things you love about scrubs is that hospital you love the location they're in. I believe it's called Sacred Heart Hospital. And you just, you fall in love with every single person there. The cast, the crew. You fall in love with the janitor, the chief of medicine, this crazy lawyer. And all of that just changes abruptly. And there's no explanation for it. And if you're just watching the show, if you're just binging it because it's on Hulu, that is such a drastic change. And you can feel the tone shift in the show. Because you know for a fact that things will not go back. And so a lot of fans of the show, or at least the ones I've talked to in my opinion, have kind of this universal understanding. And I find it with most shows like this where this happens, where they're amazing, they're bops to flops, where they're amazing shows that kind of fall out at the end of that last season. A lot of the fan bases are the groups of people that genuinely enjoy this show. They just ignore the last season. I know. I know it doesn't work for every show. But for most of us, and for shows like Scrubs, we can just ignore the last season. You can pretend season 9 doesn't exist. You can end it With that final ending, with that one character that we don't know of walking away and changing everything. And we can hold on to those beautiful emotional moments built up after season after season after year of working with these people. We can feel and love that payoff and just ignore season nine. Because season nine ruins it. It means every emotional thing we just felt is in the garbage. It meant there were no stakes it meant that this, the executives of this show, or at least the people in the big people in charge, did not care about us, the audience, and did not respect our ability to let shows die. But we can ignore it, and we can just pretend it doesn't happen. Because if you watch Scrubs from season one to, I believe it's season eight, which is that final season with that amazing goodbye, then, then you have a really good show. With moments that are sweet and emotional and empathetic and other moments where it just kind of hisses, it it kind of misses the mark. And that's fine. You can skip certain episodes. Other episodes it has like really just kind of just bad jokes that don't really land. Or it has bad jokes that should not be told. Uh, I know there was some drama around that recently with Hulu taking episodes of Scrubs down. Um... So yeah, if you can look into that if you'd like. I'm not going to be talking about that on this show. I'm mainly just talking about the scope of that show in its entirety. But I really like it, and I recommend it to as many people as I can. It's fun, it's upbeat, there's a lot more humor in it than you think there would be. And it's it's emotional, it really gets you at times. I will say, uh, if you were trying to watch with your family at parts, it does get steamy. Because many, many parts of the uh, the plots and things talk about romantic relationships between some of our main characters. And if you don't know what that means, that means that some characters decide to do things. It's never on screen, but it's always, in, it's always like, hinted at and talked about. And sometimes they do quite a bit of, like, steamy things on the show. So if you're watching with family, be aware. Be aware that you can pause it and stop it. At any time, or you can just skip those parts in those episodes. But the show's called Scrubs. It was originally a bop, all the way up until that ninth season. 
where it just went so far down the drain that you ignore it now. So if you want to go watch that show, it's over on, I believe, Hulu. Let me go take a look. I have my notes up for me just so I can remember as we go along. Yeah, it's over on Hulu with a premium subscription. You can also watch uh, it season by season on Vudu or episode by episode if you like. I recommend Hulu because Hulu is just a good way to watch that stuff at random. Um, and it's a good it's a good streaming site, okay? Because you can go on there and you can binge all the different things they have on there. But I recommend Scrubs. Go check it out. Don't watch the ninth season. And as we go into the break, be sure to stick around for our fourth and final segment where we talk about... Two brand new TV shows, relatively brand new, that I think everybody should take a look at. So thank you again for checking it out, and enjoy the break. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Hello, everybody, and welcome back from that break. Welcome to the part I've been talking about all episode, the very special two new TV shows that we're going to be talking about that I think everybody should check out, no matter who you are. They're amazing. One of them is for all family members. One of them is fun. It's it's interesting. It's enjoyable to watch. It's happy and extremely sad at times. And the other one is some of the darkest comedy I've ever seen in my life. It's only for adults. And honestly, wouldn't even watch it around, like, my parents. I'd want to watch it with close, either friends or just, like, with one other intimate person. Because that show is dark and it's raunchy, but it is funny and extremely well written. So let's get into the family one. The first one we're going to talk about is called Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, which is a new show brought to us by NBC and this show is amazing. It's so much fun to just watch and to listen. And I do mean listen, because while it's called Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, the entire premise of the show is we're following this young coder who is super smart. Her name is Zoe Clark. And she she accidentally goes to get her head checked because she's starting to have these headaches. She goes to have, I believe it's an MRI for her head. Or what are those called? I believe it's an MRI. She goes to get an MRI done in her head, and she's scanning, and the machine starts messing up, and there's this freak accident, and after that, she starts being able to hear people's inner thoughts and their feelings through song. And so how that works is that anytime she hears somebody that's singing, they're singing to her their innermost thoughts and desires. And she doesn't know much about music or anything, so she's hearing these songs, she has no idea what they're tied into, what their meanings are, and it's fun, it's interesting. We have characters in there that are singing beautifully, and it's such an all-star cast. So, just to call out a few, a few of the people in this cast, we have Alex Newell, who was in Glee, we also have Skylar Astin, who was in both of the Pitch Perfect movies, Oh, there's actually quite a few of those, but I don't think he was in the third one. But he's in the two of them. He plays that main love interest in the first one, for sure. We we have Lauren Graham from the Gilmore Girls. She plays the boss in this movie of one Zoe Clark. We have Peter Gallagher plays her dad. And then we have Mary Steenberg. I think it's Steenberg. Who is in just a lot of cinema. She's in Step Brothers. She's in, uh, she's in Back to the Future 3, I think. She plays the wife, briefly? I don't... Uh, the wife of the old guy and the... No, no, no. In Back to the Future 3, she plays the school teacher that falls in love with Doc. And so she's great in that. She's great in this show. All characters are amazing. 
So let's talk about the plot a little bit. We'll get into it. And so Zoe, Zoe Clark, all right, she is this young up-and-coming coder who works at this amazing place that's kind of like Google for computer coding. It's called SparkPoint, I believe. And she works there with her best friend, who is played by Skylar Aston. He is secretly in love with her, and he sings to her constantly about being in love with her, and it's just this funny dynamic. And then there's this super handsome guy that works with her, and he sings to her, but about being really, like, upset and sad, because we find out he has this really, like, sad backstory, and they become really close friends, and it's just this amazing show. The first season is out right now. It's on NBC. You can watch it if you have a premium subscription for Hulu or if you have YouTube TV. Let me see if there's any other more streaming sites you can watch it on. You can watch it on Vudu if you wanted to. Google Play. It's on Amazon Prime if you pay for it. Uh, not through Prime, but you have to pay for the episodes themselves. But the show is just so fun to watch. It's amazing. It's also just on television. Okay, if you can find it on NBC when it's on, I am almost certain that they are playing it frequently because this show has already been confirmed for a season two. It was a smash hit. They they uploaded one of their music videos because every time someone sings, it's beautiful. It's pretty. It's usually artistically done cinematically with the camera where it's these beautiful one shots or these long takes with amazing choreography and they uploaded one of those to YouTube in preparation for the show to get people into it and it got over a million views almost within the first week so that's amazing it's some of the songs you've loved you've heard a million times done by people that aren't always the best at singing and i say that reserved because some of these cast members kill it. And they sing so beautifully that you are amazed they're not doing this full-time career singing. Other cast members, it's real. And you can tell that they're not professionally trained singers. These are just people singing their inner thoughts without knowing it. And when I say that they sing their inner thoughts, they don't understand that they're doing it. They have no idea this is happening. The only person who knows is Zoe. So she uses this to try to start helping people because she comes across very sad people. She finds out that her mom is upset. She finds out that her dad, who has this disease that keeps him paralyzed, he can still hear and he can still see things. And she, she actually ends up using the music and hearing his thoughts to start helping him get better. And it's just this amazing thing to watch him progress and then things change and you get this amazing dynamic as you watch Zoe struggle with love, life, her career, trying to help her dad and trying to find balance between being with her father and being at work because his disease does not has a, does not have a long estimated lifespan anymore so she's trying to struggle with becoming the top of her field or do I spend time with my family because my dad is passing away and it's these beautiful moments and they create such characters that you really love them and you've become tied into them and I didn't realize it but towards the end of the show I loved every character I was seeing I enjoyed the dad the best friend the friend from work her best friend that lives at her apartment that's also her landlord who is played by Alex Newell and then the relationship with her boss is amazing because her boss in one of the episodes takes time to pull her aside and goes listen I never got a chance to talk to one of my parents when they passed away because I was working and I'm the boss here and I have regrets. So go see your dad. And it's this a beautiful, emotional moment between both of these women on screen. And they are killing it. And they're doing so well. And the lead actress who is named, who's named Jane Levy, I don't really know her for much. But she does so good. She's so... She fits the character of Zoe Clark. And it's some of the best casting I've ever seen. The show is just amazing. So it's on NBC. It's really fun. It's sweet. I recommend it for everybody to go out and watch. With the whole family, everybody can enjoy it. It's got fun songs. And I promise you, you and your family will be singing them for weeks. Because anytime I watch one of these episodes, I am singing constantly. So 
recommend it. It's called Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. It's out there for you to go listen to. Or you can watch it. You can go watch it. Okay? It's in multiple different places. Go enjoy it. Go have fun. The next show is not for children. And I do not mean that lightly. This show is raunchy. It has dark humor. It has blood. It has gore. But it's not what you think it is. No, I'm not talking about Game of Thrones. Although, kind of in a similar vein. This show is called The Great. Yeah, that's about it. And so, it's a show on Hulu. You can watch it with a Hulu subscription. It's a Hulu original. And it's about Catherine the Great, the Queen of Russia. And if you know anything about Catherine the Great, she ruled over an era of Russia that was kind of their golden age. And she brought it into prosperity, and she fixed a lot of the problems with Russia, and made it into like an amazing great empire during her time, when she was alive. So the show takes place at the beginning of Catherine the Great's reign. And I don't mean reign, I mean when she was just queen to the king of the time. Because when she was in charge, she was a lone queen, ruling with multiple different lovers and different things. But the show starts out, there's a king. It's King Peter III, okay, played by the lovely Nicholas Holt, who is in just some, some really funny things. He was in Warm Bodies, which is a movie where... It's about zombies coming back to life because they learned to love. And I'm sure he regrets that, but I, I don't think he regrets this because The Great looks amazing. And I've watched every episode of this show. And when I tell you that this show is funny, let me, let me lean in close to the mic so I can really emphasize this. This show is funny. It has some of the best comedy I have ever seen in my life. Some of the writing is extraordinarily clever. I genuinely laughed at almost every moment there's a joke. And the main cast for uh, for the Queen, Queen Catherine, is, is Ellie Fanning. Now, I don't really know Ellie Fanning from that much, but she does amazing here. She does so well. I know she's in Maleficent for, for quite a few for those movies, and She's also in We Bought a Zoo. I'm looking at it now. She's on. She's in Super 8. I didn't know that one. That's amazing. But she plays Catherine the Great in The Great. And she does so amazing because the show focuses on her getting picked from a life of poverty to be brought in as the queen and to be basically pampered and change her entire style of life to fit what the Russian monarchy was like back then. And it was a lot of drinking and swearing and running about and doing all these things. And Catherine the Great gets there to this court of Russia that's just a mess. And she just wants to fix it. And she wants to add, she wants to introduce education and science and try to fix the war that they're having and come to a peace treaty and she has these amazing ideas, and we get to watch her throughout the show. The plot of it is she's trying to overthrow her husband, King Peter, so that she can become the great empress of Russia that we all know her to become. So this is, like, it's it's got the dresses, it's got the beautiful architecture, it's got the stylings of, like, a really fancy monarchal-type show, but it's done so well. The writing is fun, and I don't, I don't usually like these shows. You, you find people in, like, these these timepiece dresses wearing these weird suits, and they're talking about kings and queens and courts, and they're talking about all the drama behind it. I, don't, I usually can't get into those shows. But the great, that's not really the focus of the show. The focus of the show is Catherine, and Ellie Fanning just falls into the role. You lose her in it. And she's so funny and good and clever, and every single person in that in that cast blows me away. It's amazing. It's not a lot of big name people. I think honestly, Nicholas Holt might be one of the biggest names in that entire cast. I'm looking through the cast right now, and I'm not seeing anyone huge from the main characters besides him and of course Ellie Fanning. But that's it. It's just a bunch of up and newcomers giving it their all and really just going for it. And the show takes a lot 
from dark comedy because a lot of it is it's jokes about how could Russia's court have been like that back then? How do you make jokes about a, a, an idiot king who's inbred not understanding how to rule his own kingdom safely? How do you talk about that stuff? And the show does magnificent. It's funny. It's great to call it what it is. It's the great. It Once again, it's on Hulu. And I just, I highly recommend it. It's amazing. It, it's just so funny. It's historical fiction, of course, because uh, while Catherine the Great is a real person who did really reign over Russia, most of the show is exaggerated. It's all hyperbole. But it's still fun, okay? It takes... Some truth, in fact, out of the fact that uh, Catherine the Great did rule over Russia in their golden age. But it also pokes fun at how she got there, the different things she had to do and to say, the different things she had to give up, and the fight she had. And it's, it's empowering to watch her because Catherine in the show is this low-standing woman who's brought in just to marry the prince and to, or just to marry the king so that he has a queen for the people – and then she, everybody's like, you're going to stand there, you're going to look pretty, the king is still going to do whatever he wants with whoever he wants, and the queen is just like, what do I do? How do I make Russia great? Because I'm here to make Russia the best country in the world. And it's just watching her go through those struggles, and it's so interesting and amazing, and I highly recommend it for all people interested if you like dark comedy, if you like really gritty things, go give it a look. Go give it a watch, 100%. So that makes our two wild card shows The Great, which you can find on Hulu with a subscription because it's a Hulu original. That one's for adults only. That's for an older audience that's willing to and able to handle some mature content. Really funny. I highly recommend it if you're into it. And then one for the whole family is Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, which you can find on NBC or on Hulu if you have a premium subscription. That one I recommend for everybody, kids alike. It's funny, it's clever, it's well written, and the music is amazing. It's one of also one of the best shot TV shows I've ever seen in a while. Because it just has amazing camera work. And I highly recommend it for everybody involved. Alright everybody, and that's our show for today. I hope you all enjoyed your hour sitting, listening to me talk, talking about some of the great things that I enjoy in today's TV world. We talked about some movies, we talked about Netflix quite a bit. Uh, just a quick reminder of everything we talked about. We talked about how Netflix can be broken down into simpler means with all their new things. We talked about the Indiana Jones movies, the Jurassic Park movies. We talked about the brand new shows on there, like The Umbrella Academy and Down to Earth with Zac Efron. We also talked about two animated shows that you could binge, both by from the creator Matt Gronich. We talked about Futurama and about Disenchantment, as well as briefly about The Simpsons, which is on Disney+, Plus, and you can go watch that. And then we also talked about Scrubs, why it was a bop to a flop. We talked about why it was good and bad. And then I brought up two great, new, amazing upcoming shows that I recommend for everybody. And I hope you all had a great day, and I hope you enjoyed tuning in today. If you did, let me know. Please leave a like or a review on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You know where to find us. And thank you again for listening to the GSMC Television Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Now, please subscribe to the show. Like Once again, please write that review. You know where to find us. Thank you all, and have a great night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program